ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا وسيئات أعمالنا ما يهده الله فلا مضل له وما يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله صلوة الله وسلامه وبركاته عليه يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون يا أيها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحدة وخلق منها زوجها وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والأرحام إن الله كان عليكم رقيبا يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم أعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما أما بعت فإن خير الكلام كلام الله وأحسن هدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الأمور محتثاتها وكل محتثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار So continue Wednesday, September 26, 7.28 p.m. This is the day of the day, inshallah. 7.28 Wednesday, September 26, 2018, which agrees <coughs> the Islamic calendar. Where today is the 15th of Muharram. 1,440 years after the Hijrah, after the migration of the Prophet alayhi salatu wassalam. As we continue on this lesson, Ya Ma'ashul Ikhwa, and we stopped at the chapter, speaking about how if something, if it cannot create, then it is not worthy of worship. And we, like we said, we repeat on all the occasions that we have the chance and the opportunity to show how Allah Ta'ala established his proof against the creation, how manifesting the category of Tawheed al rububiyyah of the unification of Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala, as far as him being singled out by his actions. And this is another example of this if you look in your books. Someone share with him. He doesn't have a book. As you'll find, this is another example how of showing and manifesting to everyone Allah Ta'ala again, mentioning Rububi of Allah in order to establish the proof and the argument against the creation that He is the one Jalla fil Ula that deserves to be worshipped. As we continue, we finish the ayah as Allah Ta'ala talks about, or Allah Ta'ala spoke in His book, excuse me, or Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala Jalla fil Ula. As we completed the explanation of the ayah, where Allah Ta'ala mentions in his book, أَيُشْرِكُونَ مَا لَا يَخْلُقُ شَيْئًا وَهُمْ يُخْلَقُونَ وَلَا يَسْتَطِيعُونَ لَهُمْ نَصْرًا وَلَا أَنفُسَهُمْ يَنْصُرُونَ Do they set up partners of what cannot create anything in the least? Rather, they themselves are created. And they cannot give them any aid, meaning for themselves, firstly. Meaning, oh, excuse me, for those who are worshipping them, he, he, they cannot aid them. Nor they themselves also cannot aid. Meaning they themselves cannot ward off any evil. Or take away any evil or repel any evil. We talked about, this is another example, Allah Ta'ala establishes the argument against the creation. Like anything in this world that's created, can it bring something from non-existence into existence? And the answer is no. There's nothing that is in this world that the pe people worship that can bring something from non-existence into existence. And the only one that has the ability to do that is Allah Ta'ala alone. If he's the one that does that alone, then he's the one that deserves to be worshipped alone. Not nothing or anyone or anything, whether they be righteous or they whether they be wretched. And we said, Ya Ma'ashal Ikhwa, and this is another example of how Tawheed al-Rububiyyah is mentioned, 
in order to establish upon the creation that he is the one that deserves to be worshipped. Not nothing or anything along with him or anyone along with him, Jalla fil Ula. We also talked about Allah to be with the Allah, negating from himself, negating from himself certain creation, uh, certain characteristics. He negates from himself of what does not befit him. Those characteristics which are called as sifat silbiya those characteristics which are negated from him, he negates certain characteristics from himself because it does not befit the one who is the true dominant and the almighty and the all-powerful. As we said, for example, Allah to be with the Allah forget, negates from himself forgetfulness, he negates from himself eating and drinking, and he negates from himself unawareness, he negates from himself likewise. This being in a state of need, such as, for example, having a wife or having a female companion or having children, all these befit the creation or the, the creation, the created, not the creator. And also Allah to be with the Allah negates from himself multiple deities. Because also likewise that shows some type of defect. All these characteristics are defects and they do not befit the one who deserves to be worshipped. So that's the reason why you'll find that Allah to be with the Allah negates these characteristics, which are characteristics of blemishes or defects or incompleteness. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala negates characteristics from himself in order to affirm the complete of what he ne- the complete opposite of what he negated. What do I mean by that? Is Allah to be with the Allah negates from himself, for example, forgetfulness in order to affirm absolute complete knowledge and awareness. Allah to be with the Allah negates from himself sleep in order to affirm absolute, as we talked about, perfect, complete life and qayyumiyya, absolute perf- perfect life and absolute perfect everlasting, everlasting of him subhanahu wa ta'ala that he creates or he does affairs and Allah to bring with the Allah never becomes tired and weary or exhausted from creating or sustaining or administrating the affairs of the creation because that would not befit the deity worthy of worship that he will become tired or exhausted or weary or worn out Allah to bring with the Allah negates from himself for example joking and jesting when he creates in order to affirm the absolute complete opposite of that meaning that when Allah creates, he creates for a reason. There's a wisdom behind it. That he just doesn't create just to what? Play around and joke around. Of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala negates that in his book. وَمَا خَلَقَنَا السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَضَّ وَمَا بَيْنَهُمَا بَاطِلًا ذَلِكَ ظَنُّ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا فَوَيْلُ لِلَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا مِنَ النَّارِ As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, وَمَا خَلَقَنَا السَّمَاءَ وَالْأَضَّ وَمَا بَيْنَهُمَا بَاطِلًا That's the eye. ذلك ظن الذين كفروا فويل للذين كفروا من النار Allah تبارك وتعالى says in his book he says we did not create the heavens and the earth and that which is between them for no reason no purpose he said that is the thoughts of those who disbelieve he says woe to those of the disbelievers from the hellfire so Allah تبارك وتعالى negated this characteristic to to affirm the opposite the complete of its opposite which is absolute perfect wisdom that Allah to be with the Allah does not create anything except there's some wisdom behind it there's something behind it of wisdom of he knows and we do not know certain things Allah to be with the Allah has manifested to us the wisdom behind it and something he's, he isn't he did not for verily that wisdom like we said some things or some affairs we know and some of them is just affairs what they call amrun ta'abudi Meaning, they are affairs of worship in which we just submit to Allah that he knows because his knowledge is perfect and we bow down to the infinite wisdom of Allah and we what? Draw the blame in ourselves because our knowledge and our wisdom is incomplete. For that which we say, Ya Ma'ash al-Ikhwa, for example, Allah ta'ala negates from himself death. Allah negates from himself for- forgetfulness. All of that in order to, to, to affirm the complete opposite of what he negated. There's nothing that Allah negates except that he affirms from himself absolute what? Complete opposite of what he negated. For example, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala negated from himself children. 
of having children, or he negated from himself having a wife, or having a female, compa- a female companion. Allah Tabri wa Ta'ala negated from himself, for example, partners in his dominion or, or, or his kingdom that he owns, which is all of existence and everything that is between the heavens and the earth. All of that in order to affirm the complete opposite of that, which is absolute what? Ghina, self-sufficiency. Absolute perfect self-sufficiency. I mean, Allah Tabri wa Ta'ala negates these characteristics in order to affirm the complete opposite of what he negated. Allah Tabri wa Ta'ala, when he creates, he brings into existence, as we'll talk about, inshallah, when we have the time, certain characteristics necessitate each other, as we'll talk about. From that, for example, is khalq, as creation, which we, we talked about in this ayah. For one, if he needs to negate the absolute wisdom of Allah, then you will find that it also trickles down into a Affecting that other characteristic, which is of creation. This we'll talk about, inshallah. Don't worry. Don't write this down. This is just side benefit. Allah Tabri wa Ta'ala, when he creates, it necessitates absolute wisdom. This we'll talk about, inshallah. They go hand in hand. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when we go say go to hand in hand, meaning that they're coupled with one another. Meaning if Allah creates, know for sure when he creates, there's a reason, there's a wisdom behind it. Is it clear, is it clear what I'm saying? Allah does not create anything except that there's absolute wisdom behind it. There's a reason of why he created it. For Allah to be with the Allah, he is the only one <coughs> that can bring something from non-existence into existence. As he did this whole existence of what we see. He's the only one that did that. And that's the reason why he's the only one that deserves to be worshipped. Because there's no one from the human beings that can do this except him, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Rather, you'll find in the creation that they need him. Subhanahu wa ta'ala, to borrow f- from what he created in order to so-called utilize as they think in their minds that they can bring something similar to existence, but rather they still use the original blueprint and the architect of what was created with from him. There's nothing from the human beings that can create at all, not even a fly, as Allah Tabari wa ta'ala says in his book, even if all of this, the creation was to come together and try to do it. For he, subhanahu wa ta'ala, like we said, is the only one that can what? Bring something from non-existence into existence and make something die and not only make it die, but re-resurrect it after it dies. As Allah Tabari wa ta'ala mentions in his book in so many ayat, that he's created you, then he will cause you to die, then he will bring you back again. Which in those same ayats is to show this is the stages of every human being. That at one time you were brought from non-existence into existence. If you used to think back and listen, look to your mind and reflect that this existence were what it was here, when you were nowhere to be found, nowhere to be thought of. There was time in this existence that passed. Then you were brought into a certain time when it was absolutely affirmed that there was people here before you at a specific time. Then you was brought into existence, and then you thought to your mind, subhanAllah, where was I all these years? Even though there were people here, and there were people that was alive, and there were people that died. And where was I? Not to be thought of, and your mind can't even reflect on where you were. And Allah Taala mentions this. He brought you from this stage where you don't what you were thought of nothing, nor can you think of anything of where you were. Then you were brought into this existence. Then you were brought in this existence. Then you will be here momentarily. Then He will cause you to die. Then you will be in the grave. Then you will be resurrected again. In order to be what brought back or been being brought, uh, excuse me, being brought to recompense of what you've done in this world. For ya ma'ish al ikhwan, this ayah, like we said, Allah Taala says, if this he's the on, if this is the one, only that can do this, then he is the only one that what deserves to be directed as worship. Nothing from this creation can do that. So you should not ask anyone or anything, whether it be a prophet, whether they be an angel whether they be from the creation, whether they be righteous or wretched, or wretched or righteous, it doesn't matter. For the next ayah that we also spoke about, and we summed up, where Allah Ta'ala also says in his book, about those same deities or those objects of worship that the people direct, they worship towards, that he says, in la yasma'u du'a'akum. If you was to call on them, they will not hear your invocation. 
And if they heard your invocation, they cannot respond to it. And on the day of resurrection, they will disbelieve your, your polytheism or you associating them as partners along with Allah. And no one will inform you of that except the one who's all aware. As Allah Ta'ala says in his book, إِن تَدْعُوهُمْ لَا يَسْمَعُوا دُعَاءَكُمْ وَلَوْ سَمِعُوا مَا اسْتَجَابُوا لَكُمْ وَيَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ يَكْفُرُونَ بِشِرْكِكُمْ وَلَا يُنَبِّئُكَ مِثْلُ خَبِيرٌ if you was to invoke them, they do not hear your invocation. And if they heard it, they cannot respond to it. And on the day of resurrection, they will free themselves from you. And that love that you think or that connection that you had in this world will turn and flip against you as enmity and hatred. And no one will inform you except the one who is all aware, who is Allah Ta'ala. As we talked about this ayah, Allah Ta'ala cut off all the reasons of one being connected as far as worship to what's created in this world. He cut it off from every aspect. Meaning, that which you are invoking and directing your worship towards cannot hear your invocation. And it's the most humiliating matter, a humiliating fact, that that which you direct your worship towards, that this is the reality. That if you was to call on it, it cannot hear you. If you was to call on Jesus the Son of Mary, he cannot hear you. If you was to call on Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he cannot hear you. If you was to call on Buddha, he cannot hear you. Rather, they themselves are all what? Created, marbubun. They are all under the what? They are all under the jurisdiction and the power and the domination, the authority of Allah himself. Where they themselves are in need of the mercy of Allah. And they directed their worship towards Allah. And they are afraid of his punishment. And they also hope for his mercy just as the rest of the human beings and everything. Likewise, along with their angels and even the jinn and Iblis himself, Shaitan himself, like we talked about before. All of them are in fear of him, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if this is the case, then he likewise, like we said and mentioned in this ayah, and like we just said, it says, even, even if he was to invoke them, they cannot what? Answer your invocation. Just a side point, ya ma'ash al-ikhwah, a person might say, what about the battle of Uhud? Or, or excuse me, not the battle of Uhud. What happened during the battle of Badr? Of what happened during the time of the Prophet ﷺ where he stood over them and he said to them, he says, oh so-and-so, didn't it not come to you what Allah promised you? Verily it's come to us what Allah promised us. As he stood over them and they were what? They were in the trench or they were in the well and they were thrown after they were killed. And he said to Umar al-Khattab, as, as, as Umar al-Khattab had mentioned to the Prophet Sallallahu Message of Allah, why are you calling to those, or speaking to those, or addressing to those who have no spirit to them, meaning they're dead? He said, verily, they don't hear me. They hear me just as well as you hearing me right now of what I'm saying to them. So how can we answer this, and what is the reason of how we could justify in light of this ayah? What is the tawjih? What can we say, Ya Ma'ashur al-Ikhwa? The first thing we say in regards to this, number one, and also likewise in regards to salams, because we know also that we know that the Prophet ﷺ said, if we was to pass by the graves of the mu'minin, that we should what give salams to them. And verily we will be what? Verily with you shortly we will be following up and catching up with you, meaning all of us eventually are going to die. Inna insha'Allah la la and we ask for Allah for, for us and you to be pardoned and forgiven. To the end of the dua that one makes when he passes by a grave of the people who died in the name or, or in the state of Islam. What about those who are kuffar? <laughs> what well, the Prophet ﷺ also said, give glad tidings to what? To those who died in the state of kuffar. Give them glad tidings of the hellfire. What about that? But th what about those narrations? How we can answer that in light of this ayah? <laughs> is that a good question? I'm going to say it again. Does everyone understand the question? This ayah that we mentioned said that they cannot hear, no one did, can hear your invocation. And if they was to hear, they cannot answer you. On the day of resurrection, they also they will what? Turn in enemies. No one will inform you except the one who's all what? Aware. Five, how do we answer this in light of the hadith of the Prophet Wasallam, which comes in the authentic narration that he, alayhi salatu wasalam, has stood over the people of what? Badr. And those who died in the battle told them about 
what has come to them or what has been promised, meaning of the hellfire and the punishment of Allah and the wrath of Allah. May Allah pardon us and pardon you from that. That he, they died in the state of what? A state of disbelief until well, the reality came to them, which is the punishment of Allah. And all of them were thrown in that particular well, they were all gathered. And he stood over them and says, Oh, so and so and so and so. Now, does it, has it not now come to you what has been promised? Meaning, of what has now coming towards you of the, of the punishment and the wrath of Allah in the hereafter. And we said that the, the dead cannot what? Hear. Based upon what we just said in this ayah. If you was to invoke them, they cannot hear your dua. <laughs> but the message of Allah وسلم, spoke to them and he, and he said to Umar Khattab that they do hear him. And also likewise, the salams of the Prophet والسلام, to the mu'mineen, to the believers when we pass by their graves, and also likewise to the dead. Of those who the message of Allah said, give glad tidings of the hellfire for those who died in the state of Qubr, if he was to pass by their graves. What do we say in order to combine, or let's just say, to not give harmony between this ayah and the, and the natural, the authentic narrations that comes in the Sunnah of the Prophet How do we understand this, Ya Ma'ash al Ikhwa? For number one, because we have to be at the area because we ain't got that much time. For number one, we say that the dead. There's a one from one of the statements of Ahl Ilm. They say in this regard. For example, they say, Hal yasma'ul amwat as salam wa yuruddunahu ala man sallama alayhim. He says, Do the dead hear the salams? Do the dead hear the salams? He used to go by one's grave, as salamu alaykum. As we've been commanded to pass by the grave of the believers and give them what? Salams. Right, everyone? And also to those who died in the state of Kuvah to give them glad tidings of the hellfire. So listen what it says. He said, for the statement where it mentions, it says, Ahl in regards to this upon two statements. Just listen. Don't write it down, anything yet. Understand what I'm saying first. For firstly, one of them they say, Anna al-amwat la yasma'un as-salam wa anna qawla al-nabiyya sallallahu alayhi wa sallam hina ziyarat al-qubur as-salamu alaykum du'a'un la yuqsadu bihi al-mukhataba thumma ala fardi annahum yasma'un kama jaa'a fi al-hadith الذي صحه ابن عبد البر وأقره ابن القيم بأن الإنسان إذا سلم على شخص يعرفه في الدنيا رد الله عليه رد الله عليه روحه فرد السلام. To the end of it, he said that the amwat number one that they do not hear the salams. Just listen. He says rather the statement of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم when he visited the graves of the believers, saying السلام عليكم. What was intended by was make a dua for them. Rather, it was not intended by it, an addressment. He said, then upon us supposedly say that they, 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 that they do hear. In the hadith in which you'll find that the great Imam Ibn Abdul Barr and also Ibn Al Qayyim agreed with him and, and acknowledged it and said it was correct. He said, rather, if a person was to give salams upon a person, in which he known in his dunya, that Allah Taala what will return his soul back to him in order to give him salams back. In which some of Ahl Ilm differ as far as its authentic authenticity, in which inshallah I'll bring a little more, shed some more light in, in its authenticity or not. But he said, at any rate, let's just say supposedly that this is authentic. He says, Let's just say they do, that they hear the salams and they reply to it. He said, For it does not necessitate that they hear everything. Is it clear what I'm saying? He said, they do not hear everything. ثُمَّ لَوْ فُرِضَ أَنَّهُمْ يَسْمَعُونَ غَيْرُ السَّلَامِ فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ الصَّرَّحْ بِأَنَّ الْمَدْعُوِينَ مِنْ دُونِ اللَّهِ لَا يَسْمَعُونَ دُعَاءَ مَنْ يَدْعُوهُمْ فَلَا يُمْكِنُ أَنْ نَقُولُ إِنَّهُمْ يَسْمَعُونَ دُعَاءَ مَنْ يَدْعُوهُمْ يَنَا هَذَا كُفْرٌ بِالْقُرْآنِ It does not necessitate that they hear everything. Meaning that they only just say, let's just say supposedly that this narration is authentic. That the only thing that they hear is what everyone? Just a salam. That's it. Is it clear? So it's just a salam. Do they hear everything that everyone is talking about? Do they hear the invocations of those who say, oh, please, so-and-so, help me. Help me in my life. Make my life a better, uh, better my predicament that I'm in, or all this hardships or difficulty that I'm facing in my life and all this anguishment and adversity. Please take it away from me. Do they hear all that? 
So at the, at the end of the day, supposedly, like we're saying, he said, let's just say the hadith is authentic. The only thing that they hear is just merely what? Mir salam. That's it. And notice in this narration that he's not making dua to them. He's making dua what? For them. <laughs> is it clear what I'm saying, everyone? So he's not making dua to them. He's making dua for them. So that's the other affair. He says, for in, in, in this case, if they try to say or supposedly say that they do hear other than salams, for verily Allah Ta'ala has made it clear in his book that those who are being invoked besides him does not hear the invocation of those who invoke them. So none of us can say, verily they hear the supplication of those who call on them because this is considered disbelief in the Qur'an. Disbelief in all the verses in which Allah has clearly said, in which we just said in this particular ayah in your books, that they do not hear what everyone? They do not hear the invocation of those who are invoking them. So in this particular narration, upon one statement of Ahl Ilm, which we'll mention quickly here, that number one, and you need to write this down now if you want, that number one that we say, what everyone, what is intended by is dua for them. Not actual salam. Or, uh, uh, for, for example, to, what is intended by is dua, supplication. Not what? Addressment. Meaning not talking to them directly. What's intended by is praying, if you want to say, praying for them. What's intended by is praying for them. Or supplicating for them, for salams, for peace. Meaning in their graves. And what is not intended by is what? Addressment, meaning speaking to them directly. So that's the first statement. And like we said, supposedly, let's just say it is authentic, as Ibn al-Qayyim mentioned, does mention this. He says, and what is intended by is that it's just to re merely give salams back and no more, no less. And this is upon the first statement of what Ahl al mentioned in this regard. <coughs> also likewise we said that Allah Ta'ala mentioned in his book that they cannot reply or respond to the invocation of the one who's invoking them for Allah Ta'ala says وَلَوْ سَمِعُوا مَسْتَجَابُوا لَكُمْ He says, meaning that they, will, they cannot respond, respond to you asking them something at all. And they're not able. All these affairs are very important, Ya Ma'ash al -ikhwa. These type of matters of what we're learning right now, they are the barriers in the shield, in the fortification, to protect us from going back to the state of disbelief. Where you find, like we said, that people who worship all the different types of worship that you'll find, especially in this world, whether they be on Judaism or Christianity or whatever, finding them that they pray to Jesus, the Son of Mary, and from those Muslims who have deviated in this aspect of calling on, for example, Abdul Qadil Jilani and other than them, from the Muslims who are upon or engrossed in Sufiya, where you'll find that they call on the dead. Or you'll find they even call on some of their, their mashaykh, so-called, who are alive. Giving them the role of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You'll find that they say, like we talked about before, some of them praying to them, Oh, Shaykh, please make my wife get pregnant directly while he's alive. In front of his face. Saying something that only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can what? Has the ability to do. In which, like we said, there's no kufr after this kufr. This is absolute what? Disbelief that will nullify one's Islam. And this is the worst type of what? Act that any human being could commit, as we talked about. Right, everyone? So we said in regards to what we, said, uh, what we just mentioned here. So that's the first statement. I don't want to keep the branch off too much. That's the first statement. The second statement for Ahl Ilm. You'll find that they say, there's an argument that the people will come and say, for example, then they give an answer to this. That the dead does hear. He said, 
مستدل وعلى ذلك بالخطاب الواقع في سلام الزائر له بالمقبرة وبما ثبت في الصحيح من أن المشيعين إذا انصرفوا سمع المشيع إذ أن المشيعين إذا انصرفوا سمع المشيع قرع النعالهم طيب some of them try to use now the ambiguity or the doubtful matter they said that the dead does hear and they use as an evidence upon that the addressment that takes place of the salam of the visitor when he comes to the grave of a person for example just listen what has been established and affirmed in the author in, in Al Bukhari that during the time when a person that he dies, that those who follow, follow his janazah or follow, follow his funeral procession, if they go away, what did the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam mention to say? That the person, when, the, when a, in, everyone dies, every human being, when they die and they put in, and they put in the grave, or if you, we could say for the, he's put in the taboot first, or that he's put it inside of the what? He's put inside of the taboot. Or he's put inside of that, that grave, what some of them put it in the board, even though he's not supposed to be put in there. But their grave in which they carry him with a procession. Listen, Camden, pay, pay attention. I know a lot of kids, they look at their fingers, especially kids his age, they do that a lot. <laughs> that every human being, when they die, and they're in a funeral procession, and their body has been put in the shroud, and then the people follow their procession, <coughs> Of course, we know that when they're put inside of the, under the dirt, we know that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had mentioned and said, what everyone? Or the hadith of Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu anhu, where he said, which hadith is on Bukhari, where he said, alayhi salatu wasalam, istaghfiru li akhikum, was'alu lahu tathbeet fa innuhu al-an yus'alu. Where the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam mentioned and said, when a person is put under the dirt and he dies, he says, seek forgiveness for your brother. Ask Allah to keep him firm. What does that mean, keep him firm, everyone? What is that narration, is a delil, clear evidence for? That the interrogation of the malaik of the angels is about to start. The investigation and the interrogation. Why did the Prophet ﷺ said, ask Allah to keep him firm? Which is a clear evidence to show that what? The grave and the angels asking is a form of interrogation. So it's not just an easy test, as you'll find that certain people say, oh, you just say Allah is my Lord, Muhammad is my prophet, as my prophet and the religion of Islam is my religion. And that's it. It's easy. It's that simple. No, 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 no. Like we talked about before, it has to be tawfiq from Allah, that he gives and inspires the slave to be firm while he's being interrogated. It's a form of interrogation of the malaika where they're going to scare him and shake him up. And in order for one to be firm, as to be success from Allah, that he keeps his heart firm. For it's not that simple. For what we say during this time, also likewise, the Prophet ﷺ had mentioned and said, likewise when a person is under the dirt, that the dead hears the steps of what? Of the people going away from him. Of those who followed his funeral processions, that he hears the, not the knocking of the what? Of the shoes of those who followed his funeral procession when they're going away. So they try to use this as a delil to show what? That the dead do hear. What do Ahl Ilm say in regards to this? And what is their answer? They say, Al-Jawab an dalilain. It's simple again. The same answer that we said for the first, we say also likewise to what? To this one. Saying what everyone? That they only hear what? The Prophet ﷺ said, just the footsteps. That's it. That's all that they hear. He said, وَلِي هَذَا كَانَ الْمُسْلِمُونَ يُسَلِّمُونَ عَلَى النَّبِيُ صَلَى for number one, like we just mentioned, it said that the answer to these two evidences that they use, what happened in the battle of Badr, or what happened in the battle, uh, or, or what happens when a person dies and he's put under the dirt, he says that the same thing that we gave as an answer to say that they do not hear everything. They don't. Only something specific. Not all invocations or the invocation of everyone that what? Supplicates. Nor that you'll find that none of these narrations are utilized where that the person actually what? Worship them or worship the dead. Rather you'll find in these narrations, it was one, number one, making dua for them, not dua to them. And also likewise, just merely just saying that this is the reality of everyone once they die. Not giving any type of justification that it's permissible for you to now worship the dead. Is it clear what I'm saying so far? So you'll find that it says that even the Messenger of Allah 
likewise. Give salams to the one who sends salutations upon him. That's it. Not responding or giving an invocation to what? To the one who so-called tries to raise their hands and dua, makes dua to him, alayhi salatu salam. That we say that he does not hear those invocations at all. Alayhi salatu salam. Rather, only one who hears that is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and he is the one that what? Answers it. So like we said, also likewise, just to sum it up, Camden, that all these narrations are only in, and this is the key point and the key note, what I'm mentioning here, is that they're only specific, specific times. So when the message of Allah stood over the mushrikeen during the battle, when they were put in the side of the well, and they were cast inside of the well, that was only at a specific time. And likewise, when everyone dies, and they hear the knocking of the people's footsteps or shoes, that is only a specific time. Other than that, this hadith does not make it what general that they hear everything. Only specific affairs of certain things. That's it. Is it clear what I'm saying, everyone? So that's the answer to what? Those two particular uh, ambiguities that one would try to utilize in order to justify making do out to the dead. So we just clarify that. Is it clear what I'm saying, everyone? Is it clear what I'm saying? That we say that the answer is just the same thing we answered before. To say that it does not necessitate that they hear everything. To give the same answer. Just the knocking of the shoes. That's what, that's what it clearly mentions in the narration. Is it not clear, everyone? Everyone with me? صلى الله عليه وسلم هذا كان المسلمون يسلمون على النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم في حياته وفي تشهدي وهو لا يسمعهم قطعا. Same thing we just mentioned here. Just give him, put him a little bit more emphasis. He said, for that reason, the Muslims give salams to the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم. During the time of the Messenger of Allah in his life, they gave him salams, and during his تشهد while he was alive, and after his death, and he does not hear their du'a at all. عليه الصلاة والسلام. Is it clear what I'm saying, everyone? doesn't hear that dua at all. And as for the second, we just said that this narration is that it's only spe in specific times. That's it. It's only for those specific circumstances and those specific occasions that happen. No more, no less. That the mushayi'een, uh, those who are following the funeral procession, that they only hear, meaning the person is dead, the knocking of the shoes of the people, and that specific time, no more, no less. Meaning after they leave. Meaning once they put him in the dirt, and the, per and the people leave, they hear the knocking of their shoes. Then we said that the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, make dua for, for forgiveness for your brother, and ask Allah to keep him firm for verily, not right now he's about to be X. Is it clear? For verily, right now he's about to be what? He's going to be what? He's about to be X. Means he's about to be investigated. He's about to be interrogated. طيب. As it comes in the Sahih on the authority of Anas ibn Malik, قال شج النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم. This is where we stopped at. يوم أحد وكسرت رباعيته. That we said that the message of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم, that he said that he was wounded during his time, when the battle of Uhud, until his rab rabaiya was cracked. Meaning that, that the Rabai is like right here. So I will say it's like right here. This is Thaniya. This is Dhurus. Thaniya is like right around here. Oh, excuse me. Rabai is like around here. Like the molar teeth. This is the molar. Thaniya is in the front. Dhurus is in the back. Dhras is in the back. And uh, right here is the is the Rabai, they call it. Like around here. This right around here. At any rate, the message of Allah, his tooth was cracked right here. Not only during the time of the battle of, battle of what? Uhud. This is when it took place. Right, everyone? The battle of Uhud, on one occasion, the Prophet Sallallahu tooth was cracked. One narration you'll find that it says that his upper part of his lip was also, was also wounded. Another narration says that his face also, he alayhi salatu was wounded. Where blood had also started to come out, he had to wipe it off. 
And it was another occasion where the Prophet Sallallahu his armor, and I think this is the st- it's also in the Battle of Uhud, where the armor pierced his two cheeks, Campbell. Where the, ar- where the, ca- where the armor pierced his two cheeks. And it went in. So the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was wounded during his time. Alayhi salatu wasalam. In this particular ki- narration, it says that the Messenger of Allah was wounded. Shujja Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Meaning in his what? <coughs> he was wounded in his face or in his head. He says on the battle of Uhud, and we know that the battle of Uhud was a famous battle in which we know, in which the Muslimun had disobeyed the command of the Prophet Sallallahu of the archers which were, which were placed on the what? On the hill. That were placed on the hill in which the message of Allah clearly said, alayhi salatu wasalam, even if you see that the birds plucking us off, do not leave this place. Do, even if you see the, the birds plucking us off, do not leave this place. And we know that the, what happened of that disobedience and which caused the battle to what? Turn for the worse. After the Muslims were what? Were winning. He's about to call you there. For those who visit al Madin, inshallah, if we make an Umrah together, because we're trying to establish some type of Umrah package, I have it, some type of Umrah package, then we will actually go to the place where the battle of Uhud took place. Because so I've been there twice. And the hill is still there till t- 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 to this day. That this is the hill where the Messenger of Allah said that the archers stay, and they were commanded not to leave. Still there to this day. Allah Akbar, Allah Akbar. Allah Akbar, Allah Akbar. Ashhadu an la ilaha As we know, we mentioned and said that during the, as for those who, inshallah, that will make Umrah, inshallah, we try to organize a package, that you'll find that the battle which Uhud took place, as I've been there twice. As a matter of fact, I was I being there three times? No, I was there two times. You'll find that they have made it a place where the people can see exactly how the battle took place and the hill is still there. And it's sad to say that the Muslims, due to their lack of learning what we're learning today, you'll find they take that as a place of so, so-called, what well, again, shaitan utilizing as a place to go and think that there's some type of barakah around there, that there's some type of blessing if they was to touch the rocks or the trees and all these other affairs. The whole reason of why the message of Allah established what he established was to warn and to ward off what, those, what the Muslims are doing to that place today. <laughs> and despite of that, he, alayhi salatu wasalam, had fought in that particular place, and they have the mountain where the Messenger of Allah told the archers not to what? Not to leave that mountaintop because they were the archers in order to what? Defend in case the enemy came from behind the mountain. And that's what happened. So when, the, when, the, when he told the Muslims to stay in that place, even if he was to what? See the birds plucking us off. After they had, as if it appeared to them in the end that the battle was over. And they were collecting the war booty, of course, and the victory that they thought that the victory had now been finalized and carried out. They descended from the mountain, and that, and, and that was where the turning point of what the whole battle had changed. Where the battle, where the enemy actually started to now win after they were what? Being defeated. Due to one disobedience. And as a result of it, the message of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in this narration, if you look in your book, became wounded. This is how his head was what? Wounded, alayhi salatu wasalam. This is what happened. 
as a disobedience from the Muslims. And you'll find that a person will think in our communities how we're going to move forward. If this is one disobedience of the message of Allah, then what about us? How are we going to move forward? And this was the state of what happened during his life, and that was just one sin of disobedience. One disobedience caused the turn of the battle and the defeat, and where the message of Allah was, all, was severely injured, and he could have been killed, alayhi salatu wasalam. For that, you'll find even Ahl ilm take from this a lot of, a lot of durus and a lot of ibar, a lot of exhortations and a lot of things to learn. That disobedience is what causes our defeat. And it causes the enemies of Islam to, be over, to overpower us. It comes due to our sins of what we do openly and secretly. This will cause our defeat and allow the enemies of Islam to overpower us. Not from the enemies themselves, but rather due to the, the wickedness of, that is done within ourselves that causes what? Allah to be with the Allah to hold back the victory. Rather, what comes upon us is humiliation, disgrace. And this is what you see taking place all over the world to the Muslims. Due to their lack of knowledge, and not only just lack of knowledge, rather they make war with, with the correct Dao and the correct call. You can imagine not only them not practicing it, them even making war with it. So if you now, how are you going to think that Allah is going to give aid and bring the honor back to the Muslims of which they deserve when you're making the war with the Dao of Allah to bring with the Allah? And that you even find that there are callers that warn against these books when in actuality, in actuality, what we're teaching is not the Da'a of Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab, rather it's the Da'a of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. For ya al-ikhwa, what we said, and which we're saying right now, that what happened during the time of the Messenger of Allah, when he now became wounded, and like we said, his molar teeth was cracked, but it wasn't removed. Rather, the tooth was cracked, and the upper part of his what? Wrapper part of his, upper part of his lip was wounded. And they say in the narrations of those who wounded him was Sa'd ibn Abi Waqqas's brother. His name was Utba ibn Abi Waqqas. Uh, Sa'd ibn Abi Waqqas's brother. That his brother was named Utba ibn Abi Waqqas. You see, he was the one that actually wounded the message of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Until it says in one narration that Sa'd ibn Abi Waqqas wanted to do to his brother of what he did to the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, rather even what? Even hurt him and kill him. Of what happened with his brother. And that's his own brother. Due to what he did to the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. This is to let you know of how the Sahaba were in regards to wala wal bara for that allegiance and that disallegiance, showing their allegiance to their what? To Allah and his Messenger and aiding them and giving, giving uh, allegiance to the Messenger, uh, to Allah and his Messenger. And disallegiance to people, even if they're from their own what? Their tribe and their own blood. So when the war broke out, and he heard that, the, that his own brother did this, in which had anger, Sa'id ibn Abi Waqqas, radiallahu an. So your father, Utbah ibn Abi Waqqas, was the one that wounded the Messenger of Allah. Not only wounded him, but like we see, cracked his tooth and wounded his lip. And also, likewise, what took place of. Of also likewise, Abdullah bin Mishihab al Zut. Sarah. Sarah Rahkallah. I saw Rahkallah Birkat. Also likewise, what took place, Fala Buddha Nata'ilam Adab al Messiah, Maish al Ikhwa, the Ra'a Majmu Abin al Nasr, Ful Mukhatabi Khatib, Fahina Idan, Yani, Hadha Lai Liku, Fi Hadha Makambi that as Salam, Hadha Lai Bari. فلا بد أن نتعلم آداب الناس آداب المساجد إذا رأى واحد من الناس إذا دخل المسجد ويرى واحدة من الناس يخاطب فلا يعني يليق في هذه الحالة أن يسلم حتى تقطع على المخاطب كلامه هذا لا يليق هذا لا يصلح فهذا السبب نحن دائما نحث إخواننا على حدود الحلقات العلمية والدروس العلمية لا لأجل أن يتحصل التحصيل العلمي والرصيد العلمي القوي ولكن لأجل أن يتعلم الآداب لأن في مثل هذه الحالات كما ذكرنا لا يليق السلام لأن هذا يعتبر من سوء الأدب الله يحفظنا وياكم anyway so what I'm saying is what we said brothers what we say in this particular narration the message of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was wounded and also likewise what we mentioned is said about with the message of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam being a human being and that he has no type of what mystical type of of seance 
where he's made, or where they will find that certain people raise him above a degree, like he's not even a human being. The Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi what? Received harm, we received pain, and likewise what took place upon him of rest of human beings happened to him during this life. Is it clear what I'm saying, everyone? So what we said in this regard, we said that Utbah ibn, ibn Abi Waqqas broke his what? Molar tooth. And Abdullah ibn Shihab. And I think that's uh, Muhammad ibn Shihab al-Zuhri's. I think that's his relative. Muhammad ibn Shihab al-Zuhri. It's his own family. That he wounded the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in his face. And we know that Muhammad ibn Shihab al-Zuhri was... <laughs> They said that he was the one during the time of the Tabi'een in which all the knowledge went back to. But this into one of his relatives had actually what? Hurt the message of Allah. Muhammad ibn Shihab al-Zuhri. Muhammad ibn Shihab al-Zuhri was from the ulama of his time. In which you'll find that they say that the knowledge during the time of the Tabi'een, he was one of the people where the knowledge went back to him. Muhammad ibn Shihab al-Zuhri. However, his family member had what? Hurt the message of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Someone who was in his family and his name was Abdullah ibn Shihab al-Zuhri, who, who wounded the face of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Then you had also likewise, you had Abdullah ibn Qami'ah. They say he was the reason why the, the two pierces of armor pierced his face sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So like we said here, Ma'ash al-Ikhwa, if this was the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he was calling to the truth, this is also to let us know that one cause to the truth, you are going to receive some type of what? Harm. And it can even reach the level of physical harm. And it can even lead to something being life-threatening. That no one is what? And exempt from that. That every affair is a da'wah, especially in calling to the truth in the most clearest form, in the clearest manner, that you're going to receive some type of form or some type of, some type of what? Some type of harm. Even if it might lead to what? Even certain poems being broken, even certain affairs where what? Where Allah Ta'ala will really test you to rock even your heart and some type of physical what? Some type of physical injury and harm. And this is what happened to the Messenger of Allah. And who is to think that we're better than him, alayhi salatu wasalam? And it still happened to him. Rather, he, alayhi salatu wasalam, like we said, the two pierces of armor pierced his cheek until, like we said, one of the Sahaba had also pulled it, the armor out. And I think it was, it was Abu Ubaid ibn Amr al Jarrah had pulled the armor out the face of the Messenger of Allah when he was piercing it, piercing it. And another one who also pulled the armor out from his face, they said, or wiped the blood off or, or moved it or sucked the blood out, who was Malik ibn Sinan. And I think that was the grandfather of Abu Sa'id al-Khudri. I think that was, that was his father. I think it was Abu Sa'id al-Khudri. Because Abu Sa'id al-Khudri, his name was Sa'id ibn Malik ibn Sinan. That's his real name. Abu Sa'id al-Khudri, his real name is Sa'id ibn Malik ibn Sinan. They said Malik ibn Sinan was the one that pulled the blood, they sucked it out. And Abu Ubaid ibn Amr al-Jarrah, when the Messenger of Allah's armor had pierced his face, he took his, took his teeth and pulled it out until they said that his front teeth, Abdul, uh, Abu Ubaidah, his teeth also came out. His two front teeth came out, his t- front teeth came out and was removed. All of that to save the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Until the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had told him, that, he, that the people used to say that he was the best of people that had no front teeth. That he was the most beautiful man that never had front teeth. Why? Because of him saving the message of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam by sacrificing himself for him, alayhi salatu wasalam. But at any rate, to prove the point in which we'll find that Ahl Ilm that they mentioned is said, that Imam Al-Qurtubi that he mentioned in the narration, or let me see what Nawawi, but Imam Nawawi that I mentioned is said, he says, وَفِي هَذَا وُقُوعُ الْأَسْقَامِ الْأَبْتِلَاءِ بِالْأَنْبِيَاءِ صلوات الله وسلامه عليهم لينال بذلك جزيل الأجر والثواب ولتعرف ولتعرف الأمم ما أصابهم ويأتسوا بهم to the end of it he says and this narration is to show how sicknesses and diseases and trials and tribulations that they take place and it happens to the prophets and the messenger who is the best of people in order for them to attain by that a tremendous reward and a tremendous Repayment in which Allah will give them. In order for the nations to want to let, let them learn that what will happen and afflict them can also will definitely afflict those who will come after them in order for us to take them as a role model to be followed. So likewise, like we said, what happens to the prophets and messengers likewise takes place to them what happens to us of sicknesses. And we know that the message of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, 
also used to complain from different headaches as it happened to her during the time of Aisha radiallahu anha I think we, she was talking about also the, how his death was going to come soon when she said way ra, wa ra sa. he said well he says well he says well amma ana he says for sa so she said oh my head hurts and the messenger of Allah says rather my head hurts he said, and they say that this was during the last part of the time that let the signs know that he was about to die, alayhi salatu salam. But to let everyone know that he, alayhi salatu salam, was still a human being. And that what happened to him and befell him, oh, excuse me, what happens to human beings also likewise hell fell and was afflicted. He, alayhi salatu salam, was what? Trust tested with the same type of trials. To let one know that he is not a deity worthy of worship. And that he, alayhi salatu salam, also, likewise, when you, if you look in your books, I don't know why everyone keeps forgetting their book. If you look in your books, it says, in one narration, it says, كَيْفَ يُفْلِحُ قَوْمٌ كَيْفَ يُفْلِحُ قَوْمٌ شَجُّ نَبِيَّهُمْ فَمَسَحُ الدَّمْعِ وَجْهِ ثُمَّ قَالَ النَّبِيُّ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهُ وَسَلَّمْ كَيْفَ يُفْلِحُ قَوْمٌ شَجُّ نَبِيَّهُمْ فَأَنزَلَ اللَّهُ تَبْرِكُ تَعَلَى الْآيَةَ لَيْسَ لَكَ مِنَ الْأَمْرِ شي. As it says in the ayah, or one narration, if you look in your books, that the Messenger of Allah had wiped the blood off his face. And he said, how can the people be victorious that wounded the face of their Prophet? The Messenger of Allah, sallallahu ya ma'ash al-ikhwa, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala upon us sent down the ayah, this affair is not to you. This affair is not to what? It's not for you. Meaning, what's the meaning of this narration? Meaning that the message of Allah, when he's seen how his people had wounded him or hurt him, that he is as if they say that he reached a level as if he almost gave up from the guidance of the Kufa of Quraysh. When he reached this level to the point where they wanted to kill him, to the point where he became wounded and blood came out of his face. That he basically found far off that they would be what? Be guided. So when he reached this level, he said this. Until Allah to with the Allah sent down the ayah in order to what? This is a little in admonishment to say, this affair is not for you. Meaning that Allah will either guide them or that he will let them remain upon their disbelief. That the meaning that the probability is still there, that perhaps that may be perhaps that they will what? Eventually accept the guidance. And this is what happened with some of the Sahaba, radiallahu anhum, which we'll talk about in the next narration. What happened to Suhail ibn Amr? And what happened to, uh, uh, what happened to, uh, Suhail ibn Amr, Wal Harith ibn Hisham, and also Sufwan ibn Umayyah. Now, Sufwan ibn Umayyah, and this concerns in the narration. Sufwan ibn Umayyah, Suhail ibn Amr, Wal Harith ibn Hisham, they had set out to, in order to kill the Messenger of Allah, and they had also plotted to murder him, and they had a severe enmity and hatred towards him. And despite of that, and to the point where the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in a rak'ah after Fajr made dua against them by name and said their name specifically after a rak'ah where he raised up after, after the last rak'ah for Fajr. And the Messenger of Allah made dua against all of them specifically and named the name, called them out by name. Said to them, said Sufwan ibn Umayyah in, in the Salah. So Sufwan ibn Umayyah, Suhail ibn Amr wal Harith ibn Hisham made dua against them. And not only may dua against them, he said, may Allah curse them. It says in your, in your books, listen to what it says. Allahumma la'an fulan wa fulan. Curse so-and-so and curse so-and-so. So the enmity reached this level. To the point where the message of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, had did what? Where he, alayhi salatu wasalam, started to curse them. In despite of that, Allah ta'ala said and revealed this ayah, لَيْسَ لَكَ مِنَ الْأَمْرِ شَيْءٍ this affair is not to you. Either that Allah will accept their repentance and guide them. Or, or continue to misguide them and increase. Or they continue upon their disbelief. For verily in this particular time they are oppressors. But however Allah Taala knows the outcome of the, of the affairs ultimately. And finally that we know that all of them became Muslim. Every single last one of those of those who the Messenger of Allah made dua against them, all three of them became Muslim. Which is to let us know that what? That the Messenger of Allah did not know the unseen. It's number one. 
He did not have the knowledge of the affairs. And also likewise, the Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, turned his affair back to Allah in order to show that the worship of him, alayhi salatu wasalam, is still incorrect. And that he, alayhi salatu wasalam, made dua and also his worship, even in the time where it was at a state where he had made dua against certain people. He still turned to Allah. And in that affair, he still, he still sallallahu alayhi wasalam, was what? Received that type of little bit of an admonishment. That this affair is not for you, meaning that the hands of that the guidance of the creation is in the hands of Allah. For it's not, affair is not for you. Continue to, to call to the truth and Allah to bring with ta'ala the final outcome of the people being guided, meaning of the heart. That is ultimately is for him subhanahu wa ta'ala and not for you. Meaning convey the message clearly, but however it's to Allah to guide the hearts. And the final outcome of affairs, like we said, all three of those people who were mentioned in, or mentioned in that particular narration, all of them came from the Sahaba. All three. Suhayl ibn Amr, Sufwan ibn Umayy, and Hadith ibn Hisham. In which we'll talk about in the more detail later on, inshaAllah, bi idnillah jalla wa az. So in this, we, ya ma'ish al ikhwah, to let us know that during the time of Abu Sufyan ibn Harb, and also likewise during the time of those who were the head of the battle of Uhud, from them who was Abu Sufyan ibn Harb. Also likewise, who was from those who had made a staunch, set a staunch position against the message of Allah Wasallam, used to, and wanted to harm him and kill him. And we know Abu Sufyan also became from the Sahaba. Sufyan Abu Sufyan ibn Harb. And also likewise, these great Sahaba, all of them came from the Sahaba. And also likewise, there was another Sahabi who died in the midst of the battle. His name was Usaydim ibn Abdul Ashhal al-Ansari. Radiallahu an. His name was Usaydim ibn Abdul Ashhal al-Ansari. Who was also one who had enmity with the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam at first. Until the point where he, when he was on his deathbed and what had came into reality of what he died, he told the Sahaba, he said, tell the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that I have became Muslim and I say, Ashadu an la ilaha illallah, Ashadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah. Until it says in the narration that the Messenger of Allah said he's in paradise. And he did not even pray one rakah. <laughs> Meaning that the final outcome of affairs is for Allah. That ultimately we have Muslims that pray all their whole life. But however, if the pen was to take over, then what? Then they could still die in the state of kufr. Then we have certain people that even in, during the time of the message of Allah, all they made enmity all the way up to the last part of their life. And they became what? Muslim until they entered paradise and they did not even pray one of God. So ultimately the affairs is what? Is in the hands of Allah to be good to Allah. That, that one should still be upon steadfastness, not to justify that a person leave all the salat, but however, what everyone, that one remain upon being steadfast, upon istiqama until death takes him, no doubt. But ultimately, the affair is not for what? For the Prophet ﷺ as far as guidance. To let us know that he, alayhi salatu wasalam, did not deserve to be worshipped. Because ultimately, Allah is the one that guided those particular people. And also likewise, or those particular sahab, excuse me. And this is the last thing we're we'll in here and we'll stop, inshallah. We'll talk about the last, ne- last narration in the last part of the book. The last part of the show. A nice hadith. Any questions about the lessons? We can stop, bro. You mean the people who's being worshipped or the ulama themselves that's upon the truth? No, they accept it. They accept it. They let them do it. I remember Sheikh Rabi'i had mentioned a tremendous fa'id, a tremendous, a, a tremendous benefit. The great, the great imam, Hafidullah. He said, the majority of Sufiya, he said, you'll find they'll say that the Salafis and other Sunnah are upon the truth. It's 
far as everything, as far as in belief, creed, worship, everything. He says, so why they, so they asked him, so why do you keep misleading your followers? He says, you got to look at the, you know, look at the money we get. Look at the, the state, the, look at how they treat us, look at the respect, look at the reverence, look at the high level of status we have, look at the money that's been given, the dunya will go away from us. So that's the reason why a lot of them, they, they what? They, they, <laughs> they allow their followers to do it. All of that just to keep some worldly stuff, keep their worldly affairs. That's it, no more, no less. But you'll find that they say the Salafis, people upon Tawheed, all of them, they, what they're calling is to correct. All of it with their opponents correct. By this, by the way, everything on this knows everyone is from me scratching. It's not nothing happened to me. So no one think I had a tour of fight or something like that. But as far as what happened during the Sufia, you'll find he said that uh, they believe that they're upon the truth. Absolutely. He said, however, like we said, in order to keep their dunya, they allow their files to keep worshiping and doing the, committing this type of acts. That's it. No more, no less. It's all about worldly things. Hold on. Say it again. What do you say? I think it's in your books. It's not in your books. It's in your books. It's in there. It should be in there. It's not? You sure? Let me see. Let me see your book. Let me see it. It's right here. It's right in your book. I'm looking right at it. It's right there. Page 93. All three. Page 93. Page 93. Page 93. Page Salbia. 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 The characteristics that Allah negate from himself in order to affirm the complete of his opposite. Or the op the comp the form to affirm the completeness of what he negated. Anything else about the lesson? Type. <laughs> Quick question. What is it taken from these lessons here, Yama Ashul Ikhof? As far as why do you think that the great Imam put this in his book? For what reason? What's the reason? Kaden. What's the reason why I put this narration in the book? Why? Where's Zakaria? He couldn't come today? Zakaria. Fadal. Say it in a way that's not asking me a question. Say it you know, in his talk, like you know what you're talking about. I like what people, yeah, he's not deserving to be worshipped. Like in a question, like a statement in a question at the same time. With the father, I'm sorry. Even if you're wrong, it doesn't matter. We all don't feel shy. All of us came here to learn. <laughs>